Hello all, Rick here with a Star Trek Discovery Season 5 Episode 9 review, the penultimate part in this series. First off the superficial levels, I loved Tarina and Saru's attire in this episode. Hers was this Romulan style dark green ensemble that sported the oversized Romulan shoulders, and Saru meanwhile had this fitting blue flowy suit that looked so comfy. Anyway, great look. We get the mention that the pathway drive is a thing now, which is great. I suspect this derives from the SB19 project that Navarre was working on in the late 30th century. This was an experiment to manipulate subspace in a way to form a wormhole-like fold, all without the use of dilithium. It was a promising technology, however, when the burn occurred, data collected seemed to suggest that SB19 caused the event. Now that is known, to not be the case, the project seems to have continued with the first installation on the Voyager J and now appearing on other vessels, such as the USS Mitchell. The Federation discontinued research into the spore drive in favour of the pathway drive for numerous factors, but primarily the fact that the spore drive necessitates specific individuals or gene splicing to operate. On the subject of starships, it was awesome to see the Discovery ram through the shielding on the Breen Dreadnought. And what's more, its nacelles actually raised up and over the hull to protect them. That's so cool. Upon finding the location of the progenitor's technology, the crew arrive between two primordial black holes. These are theoretical creations that came before even most stars when the universe was still forming, compressing matter without the life cycle of a star generating it. They cannot form any more, as the consistency of the universe is too different. They fall into the category of completely theoretical so far because there is evidence that they could have formed and their existence seems to support some other theories, but we just don't know enough about the early universe or black holes in general. Other theories say that such primordial black holes would have evaporated by now. Yet an interesting note that stood out to me is that if there is a fourth spatial dimension, then they would likely still persist. That is unknown in real life, but in Star Trek we have subspace. Finally on this topic, you can have a binary system of black holes, but most of these end up merging, something that we have even detected in September of 2015. Again, in theory you could have to orbit each other in equilibrium, but the chances of that occurring are, well, astronomical. As primordials, they have existed over such a long time that they have to be countering not only each other, but the expansion of the universe. So this entire setup is either artificial or incredibly rare, so much so that it would be a highlight of scientific observation. What I'm saying is it's a really cool idea, but with it being such a rarity, it would draw so much attention and make for a poor hiding spot. Additionally, it is a fun symmetry to see the ending of Discovery taking place at a binary system, much like the first episode did. I wonder if we'll see the theme of a second chance come up, with Burnham getting a situation similar to the one she failed in the Battle of the Binary Stars, but this time making a correct call. It appears the progenitors originally placed a portal here, but then the science team from 800 years ago created a duranium alloy casing to place around it, further masking its location and allowing it to be transported. Their casing also contains one last security measure, which sounds like it requires a passphrase to open. This phrase was told to Burnham, who assumed it gave her an advantage in reaching the tech, but apparently not, as the Breen simply tractor it in and get ample time to study the casing, even sending in multiple people for scouting. The passphrase itself seems to acknowledge the fact that the progenitors disseminated the blueprints for the humanoid form throughout the galaxy, which is about the only thing Starfleet knows of them, so I'm a little puzzled that connection was not made by anyone on the crew, even if it turns out to be incorrect. Rayner continues to be adamantly a grouch and brush off Tilly's attempts to get him to relax and positively reinforce him, but I did enjoy that her response to him telling her to quit it was just this goofy grin. Neither is going to change who they are, but I feel like they've learned a measure of respect for one another and seen that both their polarised approaches can yield results. Rayner has been a fun character to watch evolve over the show, 
and it's never been as simple as him being in the wrong all the time. He has been at odds for sure, but he always expresses why he feels that way, even apologising for his terse tone at times. Clearly he too has some anxiety about taking command, with the crew noticing he never even takes the captain's chair. This is likely because he mistrusts his own judgement to some extent. Well, no I think it's a little more complicated than that. He has shown that time and time again he has been stalwart in his judgement and opinion, so it's not that he doesn't trust it. I think he's worried that his options, in which he has complete faith, might not always be the correct course of action. Nevertheless, when he has taken control, he has performed admirably and without issue, abiding by his captain's orders and even forming brazen plans that have so far worked out. Reese too continues to get his moments in the spotlight. Fresh out of his command role last part, he is now selected for the away team and kicks ass as part of it. I do feel like he was one of the characters that was pushed aside in the past, with Washington and Detmer getting some development in seasons 2 and in the 32nd century. So now it's his turn as one of the remaining original bridge crew from the 23rd century. Even now however, I feel like we're only just getting to know the crew outside of the main cast. At the root of it all, I think there was just not enough runtime. 10 to 12 episodes a season is fine for telling a concise story, but that leaves less time to develop a wider cast overall. Although with character development, we get a payoff to Burnham's introspection last part too, with her confessing her shortcomings to Book self-admittedly at an inopportune time. This leads Book to confess he was pretty much doing the same distancing as she was. Now with them being open to one another again, we get to see them pull off a very much courier style plan and unlike episode 1 where they were at odds with it, they picked up on each other's improvisations and it works. I also enjoyed seeing Burnham wing it when she came to picking up on the small talk with the Breen really putting her alien culture studies to use. Again, that's her career specialty and I enjoy it when I get to see captains indulging in where they started. Cisco modelling ships, Janeway running through maths problems and science jargon, or even Archer piloting whenever he gets the chance. It's a great reminder that in Starfleet there are multiple paths to command. Booker accidentally flirting with the Breen was hilarious, even though I saw it coming, but an oil bath? What? I both want to know, but more do not. Without a beat, hurry up Burnham, this is getting weird. <laughs> Great. I do still find it weird to see Mol giving orders, because the brain have always seemed so insular, but there is a level of alienation here with her unable to speak brain, but she's making full use of her political position and goal. It's interesting that she also does not seem to want open war with the Federation, but also she shows contempt for the UFP, and I think it's generally that she sees the UFP as that which would imprison her, while with the Breen, she is at the top, at least for now. She is chasing freedom, but it's all pointless without luck. The portable transporter buffer is a nice bit of kit, and a good evolution of a by effect of transporters. Thanks for watching my review of Discovery 509, Lagrange Point. Was anyone else getting death flags for Saru by the way? Until the finale, thanks for watching, I've been Rick and I'll see you later, goodbye.